Well, that he looks big, and that's what I was wondering about. Yes, the, not the guy on the first page. That's actually a female. The guy on the last page is uh, a male. He weighs about 90 kilos, uh, 90 pounds, and he's a very big boy who who doesn't like people encroaching on his territory. They're, fun, they're interesting creatures. My wife does research on wombats as well, and she works with captive animals. And, uh, and these are the, the photos in here are a couple of her animals. The, that one we gave you in the in the um, article is a wild one, but the, these ones in this presentation are, cap, are captive. There are a couple of her study animals. <laughs> well, it's a, the pictures. I went looking for some things, and and the pictures where they are treating them for mange. Oh, I feel so bad for them. <laughs> I mean, that's just got to be ugly. So hey, wife works we're back. We're, we now are sort of looking at a setup screen rather than the presentation screen. Okay. Somehow that's gotten loaded on top. There we go. And what kind of noise do they make? <laughs> um. The males, males can make a bit of a grunting noise, a very deep throated grunting <coughs> sort of noise. Uh, and the females, um, when they're um, being mated or other things like that, they make a very, um, uh, almost like a scream. <laughs> Apparently, that whole process is not all, all that pretty. No, it's not a, it's, it's, it's a bit of a violent action, actually. On the whole, though, they're just completely... As far as, you know, they're pretty peaceful oh, territorial animals yeah. that that um, that cohabitate these, these burrows pretty well. Oh, we've got another mm -hmm. guest. And they're actually they're actually very closely related to koalas. Well, well the questions on these, uh, this particular one will be very different from some of our others. <laughs> yeah, of course. It's, it's <laughs> like they're, they're like underground koalas. That's how close, or, or koalas are like tree wombats. <laughs> I like it. Okay, well, it looks like we're up to two more guests. Mike. Uh, Mike is the chairman for the foundation. Ah. Uh, so, and he is our liaison to the program from the foundation. Mike, I'm glad he's able to make it. So far we have Bernadette, Rhonda, and three Mikes. <laughs> <laughs> That's hey, Rhonda, it's Craig here. I'm one of the Mikes. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> well, thanks. Glad you're here, Craig. I'm just dialing in. Sorry, I'm not able to log in. Well, I can send you a copy. Um, gentlemen, Craig Beasley was the chairman of the first committee for Geoscience Without Borders, and when he was president, he was the person who was behind starting such a program. So we don't I've, call him I've the seen, grandfather. I've definitely of seen program. Craig's name around quite a, quite a bit. Yeah. Now. We call him the uh, founder of the the idea. There we go. <laughs> cool. Craig, I'm sending you. I just mailed it out last week. After all those times, I or yesterday, after all those times I saw you, I have a printed photo from the World Oil that uh, was sent to me by Barchfeld. And so, I, all those times I saw you at annual meeting, I never gave it to you. So. Yeah, could you get it touched up a little bit for me, please? Uh, <laughs> if you like I longer hair or darker hair? I'd like more hair. Uh, <laughs> well, you're hand. standing. Thank you. You're standing next to your beautiful wife, so what more do you need? <laughs> that's right. It, it calls the attention away from me, that's for sure. <laughs> it's a very, very fine photo. It's got everybody... Um, you and Greg and Mihai and the wives. It's nice. Great. So what is it with the half hour difference? <laughs> <laughs> I am yes. We, I we, no we one just knows. accept it. No one knows. That it's was a mind bender. Bernadette and I were sitting there, you know, with each of us on a computer going, what time is it? <laughs> you know, we're trying to figure but, out okay, so what, what you, and what's worse time. in this country is that a couple of the states at the moment don't go on um, on daylight savings. So we now at the moment in 
normally have three time zones and at the moment have something like six. Oh, great. So, wow. And Queensland and New South Wales are, on, are north south of each other, you know, exactly over each other, and one, one is a, an hour, uh, I'm sorry, a half hour before us, and one is a half hour after us. Uh, if you went across borders to work, I'd be late all the time. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I was, uh, we have, what is it, Arizona doesn't change. They're the, they're the rogue. Yeah, oh, they're right in the middle. I lived in Arizona for a while, and that was always a pain. When, but that's not that hard to figure out, because it doesn't have the half hour, at least. That half right. hour just, oh, my God, it makes it complicated. Hmm. Well, uh, I was feeling rather stupid, I'll tell you. I was trying to figure out if we were going to miss each other by an hour because of daylight change yep. or not, and messing me up big time, but we got it. Okay, we're okay. up to seven now. Yeah, and um, traditionally I start right on time. Um, I'm going to actually go ahead and wait three or four minutes. I'll start at 8.05. Yeah, I think it's just that we're starting at a Oh, I've, to, I've been to one of these other ones, and I must have been 8 o'clock in the morning your time. Which one was that? Oh, I can't, oh, uh, I can't remember. Um, something from Italy, possibly? Okay, we're getting, each one is getting better, and we're refining the way we accept, in, you know, invite and registrations on these things, and going to take a little while, but this one gets more smooth in its execution. Yeah. So it's we'll, uh, we'll try recording this one today and see what happens. And if that doesn't work, we'll move on to a couple other options. We need to re-record okay. it sometime. That's a possibility as well. I mean. Yeah. I, I did think about you know asking people to do it twice and giving everybody two options. Um, that's another possibility. Well, if, it, if, it, if it works this time, then it works, and yeah. But if, if you need to, then we, can, you know, Mike and I can work something out. Yeah, I know Craig would be really pleased if we could record him. Yeah. I've heard heard you speak a couple times, Craig, about it. Okay. I'm going to begin recording. I think you've been recording the whole time. Okay. Apparently we were captured. I'll, I'll get rid of that one. Might just take a little edit there. That's what parents turn off right a video recorder. Yeah. Hey now. Okay. Do you, does everyone see the first slide? We do. Yes. Adelaide okay. sees the first slide. Great. And thank you, Adrian. doing messages to me. I appreciate that. Okay, well, because it's 8.04 on my time, I'm going to start in one more minute. We had a lot of interest in this particular presentation, and several people told me they weren't able, uh, weren't able to connect because they had other scheduled events, so um, if we can record this, this will be great. I'll offer it up then. All right, if you've seen the first first slide, I'm going to go ahead and start. I want to thank you everyone who's on the, on the webinar this morning. I welcome you from whatever time zone you're in, and I uh, appreciate that you are interested in the program. This morning, we're going to have a great presentation, but I do want to bring you up to date on some uh, events that have been happening with the Geoscience Without, Pro Without Borders. We have two big news events. Back in October, World Oil gave Geoscience Without Borders their 2015 Best Outreach uh, Program Award. That was a big milestone for the program. It was something that uh, we were very excited about, and you'll begin to see the uh, the results or the the announcements and things like that. If you were on our Facebook, you saw all of us who were in attendance uh, grinning wildly and very happy. 
we did, uh, we'll be having a full page ad in the TLE to recognize this as well in, in the December issue. So we'll be curling about this a long time. We're very, very pleased and honored to have received this award. The second thing that happened last month is that AAPG's trustees decided to partner with Chief Scientists Without Borders. This is an awesome happening for us because this is the first partnership that actually brings money and funds to the program as well. The AAPG Executive Director David Curtis spoke at our donor luncheon at the annual meeting in Denver. He said that this was a natural partnership with this program and we agreed. We're going to have a close relationship with the Division of Environmental Geology and hope to have a special session or lunch at the annual convention and exhibition in Denver in 2015. But the close relationship with AAPG opens many doors for this program in places we have not had a chance to talk about the program. So those two things are probably the biggest things that have happened in the last four weeks. Now, we are talking to a couple other groups. Um, Geoscience Without Borders has reached the point where it's being recognized by other groups and uh, we want to expand that. There's still a lot of people out there that don't know who we are. But uh, we are in conversations with AGU about working together with their program, Thriving Earth Exchange. Bernadette will be at AGU with our Geoscience Without Borders booth in December and we'll be meeting again with representatives of the Thriving Earth Exchange. It looks like a natural uh, partnership can develop there. Uh, she also attended a meeting with the Engineers Without Borders and uh, we're, we learned some things and we're going to be applying some things we learned, but we also made some connections that we'll be building on there as well. Engineers Without Borders, as you know, uh, is a perfect partner where geophysics and geoscience lets off, the engineers take over a lot of times. So um, we're initiating conversations with engineering groups as well. Uh, we will be at uh, the Sajeep meeting with the Engineering and Environmental Geophysics Society, Aegis, at their March meeting. We will be hosting a luncheon in, um, in Austin, Texas. Uh, it's March 23rd. If you're in the area, I hope that we'll be able to reach you. If you want more information about joining us at that luncheon, please contact Without Borders at sag.org. Upcoming events, uh, since I've launched into that anyway, let's talk about uh, a GWB e-newsletter will be coming out in December. If you're not already subscribed to this, please go on to the website and you know, just subscribe to it at no charge. If you think there's someone else that should be uh, getting this information, please encourage them to do the same. We've, this is our newsletter that reaches outside of SEG membership. It goes to anyone who is interested in the program regardless of their affiliations. We'll be talking about a lot of things in December. The next webinar like this will be January 15th in 2015, so we're getting close to that. Uh, as yet, we don't have a committed speaker, so we'll keep you posted. The invite to these webinars is um, you have to contact us and then we'll invite you. Eventually, we'll get to a different system, but if you know somebody that would be interested, again, please direct them to us and we'll invite them to the webinar. If you receive this invitation, you can forward it to anybody as well. Um, the next program related deadline, phase one, is January 26th. We'll be accepting uh, proposals for the next phase of review, January 26th. We have a few people already engaged in that, and so we'll uh, be looking forward to another round of reviews. At this point, I want to remind everyone two things. Um, this is the your access code is not recognized. Please re enter your access code forward for the town stop. Uh, this is being recorded, and with that, I'm going to say in large letters, please mute your phone. <laughs> your access code would be recognized. Please leave your access code followed by the pound sign. Okay, so that's finished. Again, please mute your phone during the presentation. 
and that way we won't have any background, we won't have any echoes, we won't have any uh, uh, conflicts in the presentation. Since we are recording, that's very important. The presentation today, as you read the title, I hope you were intrigued, was going to be uh, presented by Dr. Michael Hatch of, of the University of Adelaide, and the main presenter is Michael Swinborn, and, and he'll be also presenting from the university. And then the other partner on this was uh, Dr. Eliza Sparrow from the Australia Zoos of South Australia. Uh, gentlemen, I will let you begin, and I will wait for your prompting for moving to the next slide. Thank you very much, Rhonda. Yeah, this is my catch. Um, Welcome, everybody, from around the world, I suppose mostly from the United States, but there's a, a few of us from a few different places. Um, I'm just going to give a little background about how this project started. Um, it started about four years ago. Beach, uh, mem uh, board meeting of Zoo SA included uh, people from Beach Energy. Zoo S people from Zoo SA were interested in doing some work on wombats and were interested in, 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 in who to talk to about things geophysical. They, they, talked, they knew that Beach Energy had to geophysicists uh, who then were a little bit too deep for this sort of project. Um, they, they then, uh, we've got good connections here at University of Adelaide through uh, our Australian Society of Exploration Geophysicists and SEG, and uh, one of the meetings they came over and talked to me, um, and it gradually, you know, over the course of the last couple of years turned into um, a really nice project for, for, for geoscientists without, uh, without borders. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah it's, it's been a fantastic experience for all of us. Um, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Mike Swinborn. He's the, uh, he's the student who uh, we, we kind of put the project together for. He's a, we have a thing called an honors project over here. It's a, as an undergraduate, you do three years, and then your final year uh, very often is a, uh, is, a, is a whole year thesis project, and uh, that, that's what this project turned into for Mike. So I'm going to turn it over to Mike Swinborn then. Thanks, Mike. Uh, yes, I'm, my name is Mike Swinborn, and I'm the uh, student here. Uh, just a, a quick background on myself. I'm not your standard uh, undergraduate student. I'm actually 56 years old, so I'm, uh, I've been around a fair while. Most of my career, I was, a, I was an Air Force officer, and I'm actually a graduate of the uh, United States Air Force Air Warfare College at um, uh, Montgomery, Alabama. So I've spent some time in the States. Um, and, and I do have a, a sort of a background uh, in radar. I was an electronic warfare officer in the Air Force for some time. So I didn't come at this cold. Uh, but uh, I did discover that uh, I had to unlearn a lot about airborne radar to, to learn uh, the, the program penetrating radar, which were in many ways um, a bit different. Uh, I'll talk a bit about the wombats as we go along. As you can probably see on the opening slide there, um, three images, one of us, Mike, Mike Hatch uh, uh, using the radar uh, and the, a wombat in the, in the center. Uh, and some of the uh, damage that they can cause to agricultural pa paddocks on the right, and I'll talk a bit more about that as we go along. Uh, next slide, please, Rhonda. Next slide. Oh, there we go. Okay, just a, a quick overview or talk about. I'll just give you just a brief background as to why we're doing this research. Then talk about the aims, specific aims of the project, how we went about collecting and analysing the data, um, what we found and then uh, look at it, how it fits into the big picture of uh, where we're going with uh, Wombat research. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, the, the, the southern hairy nose wombat is actually the faunal emblem of the state we live in here in South Australia. So it's a, it's a fairly iconic animal. Uh, I've, I've used the words cute and cuddly there because they are, they're, they're quite frank, they're pretty cute. I wouldn't go cuddling them because they do have very long, sharp claws uh, very suited for digging in the earth. Uh, but many people here do see them as cute and cuddly animals, and that very much drives their perceptions of how the animal needs to be managed. Uh, not everyone agrees, though. Uh, in particular, uh, the members of the agricultural community, farmers, graziers, uh, because the, the burrowing ha habits of these animals can cause a lot of damage to agricultural property and even cause you know, safety concerns for farm workers using tractors and, and bikes, etc. If you go down a wombat hole, you can, you can seriously injure yourself. Uh, so that landholders can apply for permits to cull an overabundance of wombats in the area if they, if, they, if they think there's too many animals. That sets up a lot of tensions in the community because no one likes to see the farmers uh, shooting the cute and cuddly animals. 
Unfortunately, though, a lot of perceptions of wombats are driven very much by these personal views rather than any hard and fast scientific analysis. And even the government department, which is responsible for issuing these culling permits, uh, and they're the ones responsible for managing wombats, they readily admit that they just don't have a great deal of information on, on whether the numbers are increasing, whether they're de decreasing, uh, whether the distribution is expanding or not. So um, that's where our research comes in, the main aim of which is to try and uh, address the issue of uh, really how many wombats are out there and whether the numbers are getting more or less. Uh, next slide, please. So the, uh, the aims basically were to map the warrens uh, in different soil types, just to gain an understanding of how the soil type might affect the warrens that they build and how that might then flow on to the um, population dynamics and how many animals there are. The way we count wombats right now is that we go out, essentially uh, use satellite imagery to uh, count the number of burrows, the number of warrens in an area. Uh, then we use an index of how many animals per burrow, um, and then say, OK, there's a 1,000 burrows out there, uh, multiply that by the index. That gives us an, an indication of how many animals out there. But we want, to, we want to work out whether that information is actually valid. Um, but we also wanted to develop a process for the use of GPR for wildlife research, because whilst, as you would know, GPR has been around for a very long time, it actually has had very limited use for wildlife research. There's been only a handful of studies or only a handful of published studies that we know about where it has been used to look at wildlife. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. So how do we go about collecting the data? We, we, we chose four sites in the western regions of South Australia. Uh, next slide, please. And this is a map of South Australia. The four sites are there in yellow. Uh, near the, uh, I won't call them towns, they're more really just agricultural communities of Nundru, Kuribi, Bookerby in the far west coast of South Australia, and Sharinga on that peninsula called the Air Peninsula. Adelaide is in the, essentially in the bottom right hand corner of your image. So the, the towns on the far west coast are about 500 miles from Adelaide. Next slide, please. Now this is the first site, the um, uh, Kuribi site. Uh, and this is a Google Earth satellite image. So you can actually see from Google Earth that wombat warrens uh, are quite readily visible. Those white dots all over the screen there, they're actually wombat warrens. Uh, next slide, please. And we chose two fairly small uh, warrens here uh, for our, as our first site. These are Two sites about 20 yards apart, about 60 feet apart. I'll try and talk in American speak. I, I get confused. So if I start saying metres and you can't understand me, just yell out. Uh, next slide, please. OK, this is what they look like at ground level. Uh, this is looking from the north towards the south. This is the northern of the two warrens. There's actually three burrow entrances in there. Uh, and in the background behind the tripod there is the second uh, warren, the southern of the two warrens. Uh, there's also three burrow entrances. Now, in the centre of the screen, uh, just to the south of the um, first burrow, there's a, you'll see a small um, another entrance. That was actually connected to uh, the northern entrance by a very short tunnel about, about four metres long. Uh, that was very fortuitous because it gave us an opportunity just to trial out the radar, just to test it out on a known tunnel system, just to make sure we had all the settings right before we actually went into the main trial. Uh, next slide, please. Might be a slight pause. Some of these slides take a little bit to load, long, to lo long time to load at our end, so I'm just waiting for them to come up. Next, again, please. Okay, this is the second site. This is the Nundru site. And once again, you can see from a Google Earth satellite image uh, how easily you can see wombat warrens. But you can also see damage that uh, quite a lot of these warrens could probably do to an agricultural property. Next slide, please. This time we selected uh, a medium-sized warren. Um, and hopefully the little red circle has come up on the screen there. There it is. OK, next slide, please. 
And this is what this um, area looks like from ground level. Uh, there's actually three what we call spoil mounds or craters. Uh, this is from looking from the north towards the south. Now, whilst that might look fairly flat to you and may not think there's a lot of damage, if you have a look at the next slide, please. As you can see from this slide, some of these burrows can actually be quite large. Uh, that's uh, me in the photograph, and I'm not actually a small fella. Um, so you can imagine how much damage a lot of those could do to an agricultural property. Next slide, please. Just for way of information while this slide's lo uh, loading, wombats can actually grow to about uh, three, feet, three to four feet in length and weigh up to 100 pounds. So they're not small animals by any stretch of the imagination. And as a burrowing animal, they're one of the largest in the world. This is our third site. This is at Bookerby. Uh, this is also a Google Earth satellite image. And these are the warrens that we selected for our research here. Uh, next slide, please. Now, from ground level, you can see that this site's very different to the others. This, whilst the first two sites are on sandy loam soil, this is on a hard-packed clay pan. Uh, and rather than having complex warrens like we're in the first site, uh, in this site, uh, there's individual craters, each with a single warren, each with a single burrow entrance in them. Uh, next slide, please. And just flick through until you come to the um, satellite image. Okay, this is our final site. This is on the Air Peninsula at Turinga. You know, the first thing you'll notice from this slide is that it's almost impossible to see any, any um, wombat warrens on this one. If you look down the bottom right-hand corner, you can probably see a few scattered ones. And up in the top left, you see a few scattered ones. But if you have a look at the next image, when our red circle comes up, it's right in the centre there. And you can virtually can't see any, image, any um, burrows there at all. Uh, next slide, please. And the reason for that is obvious when you have a look at the, uh, the, the site from ground level. Uh, first of all, the, the soil that's been excavated by the wombats doesn't, doesn't contrast all that well with the surrounding countryside. But rather than digging holes in the ground like they were on the other sites, what's happening is here is this whole site is this layer of uh, calcrete limestone and the wombats are actually finding breaks and cracks underneath the uh, limestone and essentially just tunnelling in there and making use of the natural caverns underneath the limestone. Next slide, please. As part of our inspection that set up this area, I actually stuck my head down this hole just to see what was down there. And you'll, if you, hopefully you can see there's actually two wombats in this image. The, the, head of the, the head, one's lying with its back to us. You can see his head there in the light. And just behind them, there's a second one. When I actually put my head down there the first time, there was a, a third wombat. His, his face was no more than two or three feet away from me. He was right in the entrance. I'm not sure who was more shocked, him or me. Uh, but by the time I ran back to get my camera, he disappeared. He had disappeared somewhere into the, into the far reaches of the, the cabin, and we never saw him again. Next slide, please. Okay, so how do we go about collecting the data? We used a, a Mela X3M uh, GPR uh, with both a 250 and 500 megahertz antennas mounted on a rough terrain cart. That's it right there. Um, and just um, by way of, uh, as an aside, I'm not sure if you've ever used a rough terrain cart. Uh, it is quite useful, but um, it doesn't last very long in rough terrain. It seems to, seems to fall apart, and we spend most of our time with a a roll of gaffer tape sticking it back together again. If you look closely at that, you can probably see the, the whole thing stuck together with gaffer tape. Um, we called it mowing the lawn, by the way, also. It was these half meter station space, line spacings that we did with that uh, differential GPS mounted on the top of it was just absolutely crisscross the ground, um, you know, something like 40 meter by 40 meter areas. And uh, just that half meter spacing was so much like mowing the lawn. It was kind of Kind of dull, but kind of nice in a way. Yeah. Anyway, keep going, Mike. If you have a look at the next slide, in fact, you'll see one of these grids. Um, the next slide, please, Rhonda. Oh. You can go back to that, that grid, please, if it's possible.
Hopefully, it'll co hopefully come up in a, in a second. This is there we go. This is the um, uh, the grid from the Nundrew site. Uh, it's uh, 45 by 35 meters. Uh, those those markings down in the um, uh, axes there are, are UTM coordinates. So um, it's a half meter spacing grid. Those three gaps in the centre are, are, are the, uh, cr the craters uh, where we just couldn't drive the radar. Obviously. Next slide, please. Okay, and what we we process once we collect all the data, we process it using the Reflex W GPR software processing package. Uh, they're the steps that we went through, and you're probably all more familiar with that than me. But I won't go through them. If you if you do want more information, I'm happy to answer any questions on the panel later on. Uh, next slide, please. So obviously, a lot of data was collected at each area. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Michael, talk about yeah. This right. is this is um, essentially this is once again this is um, uh, the top picture. There is the uh, a raw image from the Nundru site, uh, and the bottom one is the same uh, image after processing. Essentially, we ha each one of those lines represented a single uh, two-dimensional slice, so we could have up to four or five hundred of these um, from each site. Uh, next slide, please. But once we um, were happy, we selected one one slice for processing. Once we were happy with it, um, we then batch processed uh, all the remaining slices using the same correction factors. We then stitched all the slices together into a 3D model, um, and then we analysed that 3D model to see what we could find. Next slide, please. So what did we find? Uh, we first of all we found a, a substantial variation in how the warrens have been constructed by the wombats, both within and between the different soil types. Uh, at Kirby, with the fairly small warrens, uh, they were constructing very simple tunnels, each of them with a single entrance. At Nundru, in the more complex, larger warren, uh, they were actually constructing quite complex tunnels, some of them with multiple entrances. Uh, at Bookerby. Unfortunately, the clay soil, the, the conductivity was too high for radar. We sort of expected that to occur, um, but we, we used the 250 megahertz antenna there. We, we abandoned the 500 after the 250 didn't give us any good results. Um, so that wasn't a surprise. We weren't disappointed, but at least to confirm what we thought about the radar. Um, at Sharinga, uh, under the um, uh, limestone, rather than constructing tunnels like they were doing at the other sites, the wombats were essentially occupying large cavernous areas both natural and artificial, underneath and between the different layers of limestone. Next slide, please. And this will just show you some, some of the results of what, we've, what we developed. This is a, a 3D model of the southern of the two warrens at the Kuribi site. Um, the tunnels that you can see on this image are actually um, processed radar imagery. This is the 3D model that we constructed. And I've, I hand drew in the spoiled man because the radar didn't actually construct that. So that's the only thing in that picture which is not processed from the uh, software package. Uh, as you can see, going out to the northwest, there's a fairly short tunnel uh, ending in a large chamber. Uh, going out to the east, there's a longer tunnel which stays fairly level for about the first seven metres or so, and then descends down to about a depth of about 1.1 metres and ends in a large tunnel. Uh, you can also see in the centre of the spoil mound a thing which I call a through tunnel. Essentially what that is is, is the isolated section of that other tunnel which, where there's a break in the middle which is the tunnel's collapsed. So the old entrance would have been out to the right there, but a section has collapsed and the wombats just use what's remaining. Uh, there's also what we call an inactive burrow. There was a burrow entrance in this warren um, that there was no tunnel associated with which suggests that either it's an old tunnel which has been collapsed and abandoned, or it could be a new tunnel that the wombats are in the process of constructing and just haven't got around to finishing it yet. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, this is from the Nundru site, the second site. And once again, this is uh, all processed radar imagery except for the spoil mounds which I have hand drawn in. Uh, this is looking directly down from above rather than the oblique angle from the first one. And what you can see here is um, that large tunnel that you saw a, a, a picture of me in is in the northern of those spoil mounds. Uh, and the tunnel sent, descent goes south from there and turns around into this ring system. And essentially this ring system in the centre there 
um, uh, can be entered from any one of three burrow entrances, one in the northern of the, the craters and two in the eastern crater, um, that, which means any wombat in this part can actually e enter or exit by three different entrances and they can also bypass each other in the centre if they wish. In the southern spoil mound, there's a long tunnel, it's called the Western Tunnel on your screen there, which sort of heads from the southern mound and sort of curves back towards the ring system, but there's a break in the setter, suggesting that once again, uh, either there's a, there was a tunnel there that has since collapsed, or once again the wombats may be constructing it, haven't got round to finishing it yet. Uh, there's also an inactive burrow in that spoil mound on the eastern side. Um, it looks like there was a, once there was a tunnel there, a section at, at the start has collapsed, but there's still an isolated chamber just out to the east there. Uh, but obviously that, that bit's no longer being used. Next slide, please. Okay, this is from the Sharinga site. Now, rather than construct a 3D model and show it like this before, the rather, it's very complex under the ground there. When I constructed one of those 3D models like the previous one, it was just too complex to, to read. So what I've done here, this is a 3D block model, and these are horizontal slices through the through this model at different depths. The one on the left, left is at um, 0.6 metres, about uh, 2 feet, and the one on the right is at 1.8 metres, at about 6 feet depth. Um, the entrance to that tunnel, the, um, the gap under the limestone I showed you before, is on the far left-hand side of the screen, that slight break on the left-hand edge of the image there. Um, and the purple in this image represents some subterranean anomalies, uh, some sort of cavities and things underneath the limestone. So the, obviously the, the wombats are occupying that area in the red circle there, uh, which extends up to the northeast for several metres, and then descends quite sharply down to a depth of about 1.8 metres. So that, um, whether this is completely natural or whether it's constructed is, is difficult to determine. I think it's probably a combination of both. But you can also see down to the uh, bottom right-hand corner of the image some more anomalies, which are probably uh, natural cavities underneath the limestone that the wombats don't seem to have access to at the moment. There's no, there's no joins between the two. Um, so um, perhaps they might get around to constructing that, but they just don't have it at the moment. Next slide, please. Okay, so what does all this mean? Uh, this project was significant for a few um, uh, uh, reasons. First of all, it's the first time we've been able to um, map these wombat warrens using a non-invasive means. The previous ways of mapping wombat warrens, the first time it was ever done was in the 1960s and was done by a, a young fellow who actually crawled inside them with a pencil and paper. Uh, not something I would recommend for your long-term health. Um, but since then, the methods have been very invasive, essentially been digging them up uh, to map them which is uh, not good because that actually can be fatal to the animals, um, but, but also from a purely scientific perspective, uh, perspective, it prevents you going back and revisiting them to see how they might change over time. Um, importantly though, this is also the first time that a warren underneath the layer of calcrete limestone has been mapped. As you can un imagine from that very hard rock overtopping those warrens, you just, can't, you just can't dig them up, so you've never been able to look at them underneath this limestone calcrete before. Uh, it's only the second time that GPR has been used for wildlife research in Australia, and we only know of four published uses of it worldwide. So um, it is a very much a learning curve for us in, in the use of this tool. Next slide, please. Okay, but like all good science, uh, our, our, our science has thrown up just as many questions as it has answered. Uh, obviously, there's a huge variation in complexity, but why does this occur? Uh, next slide, please. If you go back to the uh, first slide at Kuribi, you, could, you might recall that there's our two survey warrens on the left-hand side of the screen, and they're fairly small, but just out to the right of them, there's a number of very large complex warrens, some of them with over 30 burrows in them. Um, and the question is, why are they complex, and why are these ones simple? Um, could it just be that comp uh, the simple ones are complex warrants in the early stage of development? Um, possible, but also we don't think that's the case. 
wombats are not solitary in terms of where they live. They will, they will move from one location to another. They will use multiple burrows, um, and multiple wombats will use the same burrow. Um, in fact, most wombats will use up to 10 different burrows uh, throughout their home range. So it could well be that, uh, and they spend 75% of their time in these big warrens rather than the little ones. So it could well be that they live mainly in the convex warrens and use these small ones perhaps to extend their range out a bit further um, to, to, to escape from predators uh, or the hot sun. Um, it could well be that um, it's an indication of new animals arriving in the area and having to construct new burrows. Unfortunately, we don't know the answers to that because there has been no longitudinal studies done of these, these um, warrens, so we don't know. This is, this is something that we think GPR will be useful for in the future, to be able to look at these things over time to see how they change, and that will give us much more information on wombat population dynamics. Next slide, please. Okay. The, I mentioned before about um, counting wombats um, and using the burrows, uh, and counting the burrows and then multiplying by an index. That was originally based on some work back in the 1980s, um, and it's sort of since been confirmed uh, by a number of studies since, which have come up with a similar number, around about, around about 0.5 animals per active burrow. Next slide, please. However, the most recent study was the first one that looked at the differences between the different soil types. And as you can see, in clay and sandy loam soils, the numbers are around about 0 0.3, 0 0.4. But the numbers in calcrete limestone are much higher, around about 1.2. But I think more significantly, there was a huge variation found in this calcrete limestone, from as little as one to as much as two and a half, even more. And the reason for that is obvious. If you have a look at the next slide, This is that uh, site under the Calcrete limestone again. And as, as you can see, just by looking at that, um, there's no way of determining, just from external signs alone, uh, how complex that is underneath. It could be just a simple entrance leading into a very shallow cave, or that cave system could extend for a very long way in the hills. We just don't know. And we, we suspect that that's why variation occurs in Calcrete limestone. Um, in the other soil types, we can look at the burrows and say, yes, that's more complicated because there's a lot more burrows. In calcrete limestone, we can't do that without actually physically knowing what's going on underground. And once again, this is where we think GPR is a very important tool because it will allow us for the first time to look at the variations in complexity of these calcrete limestone burrows. Next, next slide, please. In terms of the GPR, um, as I said, we use both the 250 and the 500 megahertz antennas. Um, we know that it's limited by the clay and highly conductive soils, um, so that wasn't a surprise to us. We found it was very effective in the sandy loam and the, and the calcrete soils, which is fortunate because 90% of all wombat burrows occur in these soil types. There's only a very low number in, in clay soils. so. Realistically speaking, GPR would be a very useful tool for the wombat research. Um, the antenna selection, important but wasn't critical. We didn't find a huge difference between the 250 and the 500, except the 500 gave us better resolution in the field and we could easily, more easily pick the tunnels. Uh, but also in that um, ring tunnel in the uh, Nundru system, uh, it was much clear, more clear on the 500 than it was on the 250 antenna. Um, but also, because this is really one of the few times um, it's been used for wildlife research, we actually wrote a manual on how to do processing and analysis for GPR, so that will be a, a useful guide for future, uh, anybody doing this in the future. Uh, next slide, please. And so what do we think? Um, realistically speaking, what this study has told us is that the, the single index that we're currently using for population abundance is, is not adequate. and the GP, and we need to take into account local conditions such as soil types, particularly in the calcrete limestone, um, but also uh, a snapshot study, as has been done in the past, is really inadequate 
and we have to do longitudinal studies, um, go back and revisit the boroughs time and time again just to see how they might change over time. And fortunately, GPR has come along and we. I spoke to the university today and trying to convince them we need to buy a GPR, but we shall see how that goes. I'm only a humble student here. I don't have much influence. Um, uh, but we shall see. The, the people, people were keen and they started talking about it. So may, maybe in the future we'll get it and be able to go back to these places and, and see how things change. Next slide, please. While well, I'll just wait for this one to load, this is, that essentially concludes the presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. This little fellow here on, on, the, on the end is one of my favourite wombats. He's one of my wife's research animals. His name's Wilson. Uh, and his favourite trick is he's got a big bowling ball in his pen that he likes to play and roll over and jump on and stuff like that. So he's actually a very, a very personable creature, just not one you would like to get uh, too close to. Apparently he's the 90 pounder. He's 90, he's 90 pounds. <clears throat> Michael, thank you very much, both Mike and Mike. And uh, now let's open to questions. Please unmute your your phone and go ahead and ask questions. Michael, what are the natural predators for these animals besides irate farmers? <laughs> irate farmers are probably the worst. Uh, the other main natural predator for them is the dingo, uh, the, the Australian native dog. Um, that's one of the reasons why we don't know how many there are, because you may not be aware, uh, back in the uh, last, well, in fact, the 19th century, uh, to, in order to exclude dingoes from uh, sheep grazing country, because dingoes like eating sheep, uh, they, they built this massive fence, which is probably about 3,000 miles long, which essentially cuts the southeastern corner of Australia off from the rest. That runs right through the middle of wombat country. Um, so wombats on the south side of the fence uh, have been protected from the dingo and therefore uh, they're not being predated upon. Wombats on the north side of the fence are subject to predation and uh, their numbers we, uh, are much lower and uh, the, the numbers of wombats per burrow is much lower as well. So I guess one of the points of this study is, is that it's really We've, we've just done four sites in three or four different ki kinds of, uh, of, of warrens, and obviously there's, even within the areas where we're working, there's, there's thousands of warrens and, you know, and thousands of different you know, complexities. And, and then there's also the question of how, you know, what, what, is the, what, what, what would these things look like on either side of the dingo fence? There's still a, a, a lot of questions I'm sure that can be, uh, can be done up with a little bit more research. What has the, the outreach been to the agricultural community and how is that accomplished? I'm sorry, say that again, sorry? How are, how are you communicating this research to the agricultural community? Is that done through others? Now, we um, occasionally run conferences with the agricultural community because, um, uh, as you might imagine, we're, they're, they're very interested in what we're, we're doing. Uh, they want to know how many there are. Um, but also we're, we're also developing mechanisms to um, uh, help perhaps control them by non-lethal means. Um, Lisa Sparrow, who was one of the uh, helpers on this, is, is, has a project where they use dingo urine scattered around the farms to try and repel uh, wombats, which is actually uh, reasonably successful. I'm not sure how she collects dingo urine. I'll, I'll, <laughs> she, can, she can probably explain that much better than me. Um, uh, it's, it's also a very important tool for the, uh, this is the important tool for the um, uh, government department doing the management because they really, when farmers apply for culling licences, um, they just don't have the resources to do an adequate assessment of how many wombats there might be in the area. So they just generally just write, yes, yeah, sure, you can cull. Um, if we had a much better idea, certainly at the um, local regional level of how many wombats there are, whether the numbers are increasing or decreasing, uh, we could offer much better management advice to both the farmers and the and the and the um, government department. Elisa has been working in this field for a long time. Elisa and, this, and David Taggart uh, have been working in this field for a long time, and actually have, have got very good relations with the, with the local farmers. They're they're, uh, they're they, yeah they, they've really worked at making sure that the farmers are on side with what they're doing and and, and see the importance. Really quite a, a good effort on their part. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> I was going to ask if there's sufficient land for both the farmers and the wombats to live 
collaboratively. Um, the, 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 the wombats tend to prefer open grassland. Um, the, na the native vegetation out in that part of the world is generally um, closed scrub. So uh, whilst there would have been wombats there in the natural um, uh, landscape, it would, I suspect there were nowhere near as many as there are now. Once the farmers have cleared the scrubland out and turned it into um, grazing country or, um, or um, uh, cropping land, then they grow cereal crops out there as well. Uh, the wombats go, yes, yeah, this is great, and they turn up in huge numbers. If you remember from those satellite images, um, how many how many burrows um, can be in the area? We we did surveys uh, while we we're doing this, and actually walked the ground counting the number of burrows, and within one kilometre, so what's that about 0.6 of a mile of uh, each of those uh, first two sites, there were over 1,000 wombat burrows, which is a lot. Yeah, it is. Um, so uh, and, uh, I'm going on to do some more research in the future on this because uh, wombats are important not only because they're a, um, a, um, a native animal, they're also important because they do uh, important ecosystem work. They, they break up these hard soils, um, they provide shelter uh, and homes for other animals, uh, they uh, help turn over the soil, uh, the soil mycorrhiza, etc. So they're important ecosystem engineers and no one wants to see them vanish but there's a fine line between having too many and having not enough. And that's one of the things we'd like to try and get a handle on. What is a reasonable uh, number to have in an area? And one other question about, since you didn't have a GPR uh, at the university, who loaned you one? Or did you rent it? We rented it from uh, Mala, from the Malak uh, distributor here in this country. So okay. got a pretty good rate. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it, it, it all ends up being relatively commercial. So. I also sure. wanted to ask I, um, about the um, differential GPS. So I'm assuming you use differential GPS. Yep. It. I I think it's just a, st a standard. Oh, geez, the brand was a Hemisphere or something like that. Hemisphere. It, it was the, the standard one that they they just brought along with it. Good down to a couple of centimeters, probably um, worked very well. Hemisphere RTK 320, I think, was the model number <laughs> that we got from, from memory. Um, uh, we, you know, it, it worked well. We, we had some issues, you know, probably from finger trouble as much as anything when we first started using it. But it, it provided good good service over over the, over the time. We we had a, I think, uh, as part of my data editing process, I probably had to delete a couple of lines in each site because the, the, we lost contact between the GPR and the GPS. But uh, no, it, it was worked well. We got good information. Is, is that the question that you were asking about that? Yeah, I was, I was just wondering how you integrated the, the differential GPS with the, the GPR, whether that was done um, automatically on board or was that done in post-processing? Pretty much that the, the two data sets are, we're, we're integrated right on the machine as far as I know. I think they've got a pretty good system for that at the moment. And uh, I have seen stuff where, you, where it is really a pain to, uh, to, to get the two to uh, t talk to each other in post-processing. But this, this, I think, was relatively uh, oh, a yes, good fit. Yes. Uh, once, once it was integrated in the field, I said that was, that was a learning curve to us. But once, once we had the data, I, it was very easy to, very easy to uh, construct the models. Um, that, um, that grid you saw um, when I showed you, that was all um, uh, mapped using the GP, GPR information, GPS information automatically in the, in the that finish your question, Sue? Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Thanks. Thank you. Well, I am very, very pleased with this presentation this morning. I appreciate you staying up into Friday, since I guess it is Friday in where you are, and I uh, will look forward uh, to hearing from people. Any comments later, I'll forward them on to you. And unless anyone has any other questions, we'll look forward to uh, more reports and more activity, and I hope to have more people again in January for the next webinar. Thank you all for participating. Thank you for having us, and thank you, Rhonda. Rhonda, it's been a great opportunity. Good. I'll, I'll sign off and thank everyone again. Bye now.
Bye-bye from Adelaide.